It gets so quiet when it gets darker. Hello. Hi, everybody. Thank you. It's so, so nice to be together, right? To gather, even with masks on. So I, we appreciate it. Um, thank you so much for coming in person. Uh, we are so very, very grateful for your presence at the MCA Chicago every day. My name is Madeline Grinstein, and I'm Pritzker Director of the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago here. And I want to thank all of our staff, our production team, everybody here tonight for this wonderful, wonderful evening. Thank you. And I want to thank you for being here and being our supporters, as well as the supporters of the Chicago Humanities Festival. Um, before we get to the conversation, a reminder to please turn off your phone, unless, of course, you're using it for captioning. Um, so thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you also for our, uh, to our generous funders who have contributed to making this program possible and the, for the funders for Chicago Humanities Festival. A complete list uh, is um, to my right. Um, this evening, of course, we are absolutely thrilled to present the keynote of our annual dialogue series, Elizabeth Alexander on the Trayvon Generation in conversation with Chicago's own Romy Crawford, Dr. Romy Crawford. And outside you will see these wonderful, beautiful books and they are signed, so buy them. The MCA dialogue series is part of our museum-wide commitment. It is now 15 years that we have done this series and it is part of our commitment to a sustained inquiry about the intersection of museum practice, inclusion, racism, and uh, race rather, and uh, access. And it shines a light on eminent speakers uh, who explore issues of our time. Elizabeth's book in particular explores one of our society's more complex and heartbreaking issues, which is the color line, which as she writes, is a fundamental, formative, constitutive American problem. Michael Green is co-creative director of the Chicago Humanist Festival. He also was formerly working here with us at the MCA, we're proud to say. He will say more about um, the speakers in a moment. Before Michael comes to the stage, I also want to note two upcoming events that you all might be interested in joining us for again. This Saturday at 2 p.m., we are hosting the opening day panel for the exhibition Forecast Form. Art in the Caribbean Diaspora, 1990s to today. I promise you this is an unbelievable, precedent-setting, canon course-correcting exhibition. You're going to love it. It's gorgeous, it's smart, it's necessary. And it features artists Teresita Fernandez, Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, Chris Cogier. That panel in, in exhibits these art, rather presents these artists in conversation with the MCA curator, Carla Acevedo Yates. Tickets are available online. There is one remaining MCA dialogue program this year, Tuesday, November 29th at 6 p.m. We are co-presenting again with our friends at the Chicago Humanities Festival in a panel involving Chicago architectural thinkers, Lee Bay, Blair Kamen, and Lori Peterson, moderated by Jen Masenberg, the executive director of the American Institute of Architects. Online tickets as well as in-person tickets available. And lastly, I want to thank our friends at the Chicago Humanities Festival for being such a terrific partner throughout this dialogue series, shepherding us through this program at this naughty moment when we're working online and offline. And uh, thank you as well for being our thought partners as we navigate this time together and to continuing to build on this collaboration, which we have participated in together for a long time now. And with that, I would like to introduce you and invite Michael Green to come to the stage, co-creative director of CHF. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. Um, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for being here tonight. And it's really, it really feels super nice to be back here at the MCA and to be back here on the MCA stage and introducing this really incredible program tonight in partnership with the MCA, of course. So as Madeline said, my name is Michael Green. I am one of the new co-creative directors at the Chicago Humanities Festival, and I'm thrilled to welcome you tonight to our program with Elizabeth Alexander. I'd like to thank the MCA for partnering with CHF on a series of programs this fall, which Madeline mentioned, all of which have been presented as part of the museum's dialogue series and in response to our shared theme this year of public. 
On October 22nd, we presented a conversation with artists Rick Lowe and Amanda Williams on the transformative power of public art. And as Madeline noted, coming up on November 29th here at the MCA, we'll present a panel exploring the past, present, and future of Chicago's public spaces. For our program this evening, Elizabeth Alexander will present a reading from her recent publication, The Trayvon Generation. Following this, she'll be joined in conversation by Professor Romy Crawford, and we'll end the evening with an audience Q&A. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speakers. Elizabeth Alexander is a prize-winning author, renowned poet, educator, scholar, and cultural advocate. Among the 15 books she has authored, her memoir, The Light of the World, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Biography of the National Book Circle's Critics Circle Award in 2015. And her poetry collection, American Sublime, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Poetry in 2006. Her most recent book, The Trayvon Generation, was released in April, uh, April 2022, this, just this past year. Over the course of an esteemed career in education, she has held distinguished professorships at Smith College, Columbia University, and Yale University, where she taught for 15 years and chaired the African American Studies Department. Dr. Alexander is currently president of the Mellon Foundation, the nation's largest funder in arts, culture, and the humanities. Joining her on stage this evening will be Romy Crawford. She has a research practice that explores areas of race and ethnicity as they relate to American visual culture. Select publications include co-author of The Wall of Respect, Public Art, and Black Liberation in 1960s Chicago, and Floating Monuments for the Wall of Respect. She conceived and initiated the Black Arts Movement School modality and is chair and professor in the Visual and Critical Studies Department at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Now, please join me in welcoming, eventually, Romy Crawford, but first on the stage, Elizabeth Alexander. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. It is so wonderful to be here, and thank you for all the introductions. Thank you for the hosting. And the only thing that wasn't in that introduction is that I spent seven years here in this city at the University of Chicago. <laughs> so it's a wonderful homecoming to be back in Chicago, and, and I know that in, in the darkness there are people I love. So I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, and very excited to be in conversation with the great Romy Crawford. So um, I'm going to start off and read some to you from the Trayvon generation. And uh, I, I'm also particularly appreciative that um, a lot of the art that is in the book that goes throughout the book um, was rotating and I think will we'll come on our screen again. So I'm going to read from the middle, uh, the section that's called the Trayvon generation, and I'm going to read um, some from the end. This one was shot in his grandmother's yard. This one was carrying a bag of Skittles. This one was playing with a toy gun in front of a gazebo, black girl in bright bikini, black boy holding cell phone. This one danced like a marionette as he was shot down in a Chicago intersection. The words, the names, Trayvon, Laquan, bikini, gazebo, Lucy, Skittles, two seconds, I can't breathe, traffic stop, dashboard cam, 16 times, his dead body lay in the street in the August heat for four hours. I can't breathe. Again, nine minutes and 29 seconds of a knee and full weight on his neck. I can't breathe. And then, Mama, George Floyd cried. George Floyd cried, Mama, I'm through. The kids got shot and the grown-ups got shot, which is to say the kids watched their peers shot down and their parents' generation get gunned down and beat down and terrorized as well. The agglomerating spectacle continues. Johnny Germain Rush, Nania Kane, Danny Ray Thomas, Dejuan Hall, Atatiana Jefferson, Demetrius Brian Hollins, Jacqueline Craig and her children. And then the iconic Alton Sterling, Eric Garner, Sandra Bland, Walter Scott, Brianna Taylor, Philando Castile. I call the young people who grew up in the past 25 years the Trayvon generation. They always knew these stories. These stories formed their worldview. 
These stories helped instruct young African Americans about their embodiment and their vulnerability. The stories were primers in fear and futility. The stories were the ground soil of their rage. The stories instructed them that anti-black hatred and violence were never far. They watched these violations up close and on their cell phones so many times over. They watched them in real, near real time. They watched them crisscrossed and concentrated. They watched them on the school bus. They watched them under the covers at night. They watched them often outside of the presence of adults who loved them and were charged with keeping them safe in body and soul. This is the generation of my sons, now 23 and 24, and their friends who are also children to me, and the university students I have taught and mentored and loved. And this is also the generation of Darnella Frazier, the 17-year-old Minneapolis girl who came upon George Floyd's murder in progress while on an everyday run with her cousin to the corner store on May 25th, filmed it on her phone, and posted it to her Facebook page at 1.46 a.m. So that's the chapter uh, from the chapter, The Trayvon Generation. And and so then we move forward and Every black mother I know is exhausted in her own way. I think every black mother must dream her fears about our children. I cannot write my dreams for fear they will come true if I speak them into form. One friend tells me of a dream she had when she was, where she was flying in an old-fashioned twin plane with her teenage son. They were flying in tandem until she was suddenly ejected from the plane seat and fell, fell, fell to the ocean below. She looked up and saw her son continue to fly while the pieces of her side of the plane broke off. Wings, engine, body. He continued to fly the half plane, but she knew it could not support him. Her desperation was animal and wild. I pushed my body through the air to try to reach him, she tells me. And then my dream ended. Or black mothers are not dreaming because we are so exhausted that the dream space is without language or image, just darkness. If black children belong to us, and we need not be mothers or fathers or even black for black children to belong to us, a part of us is always vigilant and always exhausted. In spring, I listen to communities of birds from my New York window, high above any treetops. Tree they are migrating birds, a friend tells me, and some have come from as far as South America. She tells me that such birds have two-chambered brains that allow them to sleep as they fly. This is what it means to sleep with one eye open. I feel there is no better metaphor for the never rest of people who love and take responsibility for black children, and especially for black mothers. I wish for our young people freedom of movement, of thought, of imagination. That is why the brilliance of our writers and artists is so crucial for them to learn from and to call them into their own imagining and self-expression. And our tradition has an infinite supply of stories of ingenious survival and making a way out of no way. We do not yet know what a more just future looks like. We do not fully know what freedom feels like. It will take many forms. I wish also for our young people rest from the unending labor that is race work and from the spectral anxiety that is part of what it is to be black. Peter Kuhnhart's film, King in the Wilderness, chronicles the last year in the life of Martin Luther King. Lonely as he leaves the ones he loves to do the work he must do, and that he senses may bring him to his death. It is narrated by Dr. King's friends and associates from that time, now elders, who tell us about that year. They are not only elders, they are survivors. And we understand the profound sacrifice and loneliness that can accompany visionary leadership and righteous work, 
as well as feeling a deeper sense of King, the human being, and the ideals he and his gener generation mates were serving. My father was one of those people who worked with Dr. King and other civil rights leaders, bringing them to the White House to meet with President Johnson and advance the shared goals and hopes of that period. He was a young man, 30, 31, working as special counsel to the president in that short, potent stretch of complicated American history. In King in the Wilderness, my father was 83. He leans forward into the camera when he speaks, eyebrows raised to open his face wide in urgency. They discovered only after Martin King, he called him Martin King's death, that he was more radical than they actually knew, he says. I don't think he wanted us to take anything other than all that we deserve. And that's what radicalism is about, using the power that you have to transform society for the better. Art and history are the indelibles. They outlive flesh. They offer us a compass or a lantern with which to move through the wilderness and allow us to imagine something different and better. The human connection has been all but gone in the last few years of the global pandemic that has kept us apart from the people we love, the culture we need, and touch we crave in a time when we most need to love and grieve. Millions of people are missing the dead they were unable to comfort in their final hours and be with than they, when they passed or ritualize after they died. Half of planet Earth was sequestered for 18 months. If we think we can measure the effect of that right now, we are wrong. The losses have been disproportionately black and brown. But if we are overstimulated by the technology that brings images to us, we are also connected by it. The art, the ideas, the words, the exchanges that teach and inspire us are more widely available to us than ever before. The ability to organize on the ground has now been enhanced by the ability to organize virtually. Artists make radical solutions all day long. Soup from a stone, beauty from thin air. We see and try and discard and see again. We vision, we invent, we do it in the dark, we bring it into community. Artists continue to generate in a dangerous world that is nonetheless overflowing with life force and power. Creativity, making, and imagining animate black self-determination with that which only culture can provide. And people make movements and history with that force of creativity. The truly heroic drama of black struggle is seen in the vivid figurative language of visionary leadership, the tableau of fierce and proud resistance, the blazing beauty of people who survive indignities that might seem unbearable, the style and innovation with which black people keep on stepping, offering countless examples to remind us of what has been overcome as well as to spark possibility for envisioning the new. We black people were largely brought to this soil in the category of property. In the eyes of law, we were three-fifths human. Out of this status, we became the seers who have continuously articulated the problem, the hope, and the possibility of America. We have expressed the core of what it is to be human and to aspire to better enact that humanity. I believe we have been able to do this because we have accessed near ancestral knowledge and wisdom. For our enslaved progenitors are within reach of memory and lore still in our families, as well as the energy, courage, and new sight of the young people who so often catalyze our movements. There is no progress without generations working together. And there is no North Star without vigorous creativity to imagine it for us and mark where it lights the way. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Hello. <laughs> really amazing. Um,
you know, I had to bring my, my book onto stage because, um, because it's really mangled. <laughs> um, I was on, on the plane the other day, and, and the person next to me said, uh, you must really like that book, because she, she saw me, um, you know, folding each of the pages, every page. And I, I said to her, I said, well, it's a gem. And, um, you know, that just left it at that. But, it, it, you know, I stand by that. Um, there's, there's something that's so multifaceted about it um, that, that, I, that, was, that was amazing to me. Um, and, and, and so, of course, there's the facet, you know, of, of art. You know, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a book that really holds and captures and absorbs so much contemporary art. Um, but the, the facet that I, I think I want to, to discuss or the way that we can, can have our conversation is through the facet of language. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, you are, um, as you describe, an organizer of words. And the language that shows up in this book is so compelling. Um, mm. Compelling insofar as it has a real utility. I needed these words to be able to describe some of the things that um, I needed to feel mm. post Trayvon. Um, and so I wanted us to, to have our conversation really through some of, these, some of these incredible word ideas that you bring to us. Great. Um, and there's so many of them, but, but you know, one of them um, is um, the didactic violence of monuments. Uh, yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it's really it's really a powerful way um, to speak about something that I think many of us have been thinking about um, uh, to to platform the need for new monuments, new forms of of of, of, of memorialization of remembrance. And the book is so much about remembrance, also. Um, but one of the questions I, I have about this, this didactic violence of, of monuments um, is, is as we move into new forms, can those ever be as successful as the ones that, that, that you write about mm -hmm. in the book, those that are heroic and grand and that um, teach us as we pass by them? So just well, how, how can we create new successful monuments that, that do that same work and have the same power? Yeah, well, you know, I think that what has been and why I write about monuments in, in the book is, and I write specifically about Stone Mountain, mm -hmm. the biggest Confederate monument in the world. It runs across a natural mountain in the biggest tourist attraction in the state of Georgia outside of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a bas-relief sculpture that took many, many years to make. Uh, it venerates uh, the Confederacy lost. So it, it venerates, as so many U.S. military bases named for Confederate generals who lost the war, they were bad at war, <laughs> but then the army bases are named for them, and some of them actually were not even, they were, you know, traitors to the country. So, you know, it's, it's just a, a, a crazy thing. If you, once you start thinking about monuments and their meaning, once you start thinking about the Confederacy and its disproportionate veneration, you mm -hmm. just can't stop. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, I often think about uh, and try to talk about it as if you were holding the hand of a five-year-old child, right? Who says, mm -hmm. what's that? Who's that? Why? What yeah. do they do? Why are they so big? I feel small. I feel scared. It's cold. Why is the black man naked? Why is the native man does have right, that on his right, head? Right. You know, I mean, all of the questions that you naturally ask about why you know, acts of war in steel made by individual white men on rearing horses dominate the way this country tells the story of itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, when you sort of say it like that, then it doesn't really make a lot of sense. So I think that one of the interesting challenges for um, next generations of monuments is how will they think about scale? Right. How will they think about, uh, you, you know, interacting with humans? Uh, will uh, history always be represented by individual people, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's not how it happens, right? Um, and not to say that there aren't extraordinary catalyzing people in history. Must it always be permanent? So one of the things I really um, think is so compelling, and in my work at the Mellon Foundation, we have a huge monuments projects. So we're trying to tell the story a whole different way. So thinking about something like Richmond, Virginia, you know, before Robert E. Lee and the other Confederate statues along Monument Avenue were taken mm -hmm. down, mm -hmm. uh, and after George Floyd's murder, two artists, Klein and Crickey, 
made projections onto Robert E. Lee. George yeah, Floyd yeah. on Robert E. Lee. Breonna Taylor projected on Robert E. Lee. John Lewis projected on Robert E. Lee. You know, movement uh, 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 heroes projected onto Robert E. Lee. Mm -hmm. You know, Sojourner Truth projected onto Robert E. Lee. So none of that stays. And in fact, actually, of course, as we know, the monuments were taken down. Right. Uh, you right. know, all of them uh, in a, in a you know a, a public uh, moment of mm -hmm. saying, you know, this thing to happen enough, right? that yeah. pressured the city and the public. Yeah. I mean, I've been I was in Richmond recently and saw the graveyard of the Confederate monuments. It's, it's in a water, they're held in a water treatment plant. Mm -hmm. It's bigger than, it's this room times 10. They're laid out end to end. They're dead. Yeah, they're dead. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, what will, and I met the man, the brother, who's the contractor, who took Robert E. Lee out of the ground. And he said, we had to practice in the darkness because there were so many death threats. Oh my goodness, yeah, yeah. And I had my people do it fast. We got him out of the ground in mm -hmm. under an hour because we had to. Right. But they did archeology span and aerial, they planned for a year yeah, yeah. because they knew they had to do it fast because they knew how dangerous they know, it they, was. And also they know the, the power. You know, and they know, they know the so power. Much, right? So I mean, that's a, a lot of story to say. And then yeah. finally, just to say also about Stone Mountain, which I uh, saw, had not seen before, went to recently. And at, at a gathering with friends and friends of friends in Atlanta who were kind of across their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, they were like, you know, mostly black crowd. Why are you going to Stone Mountain? <laughs> because I have to see I have it, to see it. I want to go to Stone Mountain yeah. I need to see I need to bear witness I need to be able to you know and you know they have a laser show every Saturday night where Robert E. Lee comes to life and he bring, <laughs> brings up I mean it's a trip it's really really a yeah. trip but they said to the one we weren't allowed to go to Stone Mountain when we were growing up but we didn't have to be told not to go and here people in their 30s 40s mm -hmm. Because we could see the clans burning their crosses, yeah, the clan burning yeah. their crosses on top of Stone Mountain. Yeah, yeah. So you didn't have to go there to be terrorized by there at a place which, in its physicality, made people who wanted to enact their white supremacy and terrorize others feel perfectly comfortable mm -hmm, mm -hmm. going up there and doing it. So yeah. these monuments, there are actions, not just ideologies that go along with these spaces. Mm -hmm. And so I think that I give the example of the Cricky and Klein to say there are so many different ways. I mean, even to have more memorials and monuments made by actual artists, so many of them, are, I don't care who they are, they're just so ugly, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think about something like Alison Sars, Harriet Tubman in Harlem um, that is just so, beautiful, made with the power of that great artist. Right. And when you see that Harriet Tubman, you want to go north and see <laughs> people with her. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. there's just a powerful sense of, of, uh, of movement and hope and what it means for everybody, you know, not just for black women or for, you know, to say Harriet Tubman, someone who went back to free people 19 times. Yeah, let's remember her. Yeah, let's no, exactly. remember her and learn yeah. from that story. Yeah, no, it's in, it's incredible that there's such a limited repertoire of, of forms, of materials, of uh, again scales, duration, all of it, and it is so. Um, all of those are, are open to us. What is shocking to me is somebody who also thinks a lot about this um, yes. and actually kind of you know is, has made a, cl a claim and a stake for the possibility and potential of monuments that look and feel and, and operate differently. But this issue of how we can can acclimatize to those being as successful is a, is a tough one, you know? It's, yeah, um, but I think that also, I mean, just in your work, I mean, just thinking mm -hmm. about the wall of respect. Right, I mean, right, you know, yeah. what, what yeah. I always thought was, the, the wall of respect was down by the time I moved to Chicago, right. but I always knew it had been there. It was there, yeah. And yeah. knew what it meant, mm -hmm. and knew it through Gwendolyn Brooks' uh, mm -hmm. great poem, The Wall, the wall yeah. uh, where you know people gathered, where she contrasted, uh, I mean, she's written all about this, so I'm just, I'm telling, you, I'm telling you these things that she knows great. much better than I do. No, um, but you know, the way she compares the Chicago Picasso oh my to God. the wall, and the way that people are invited mm -hmm. to be at the wall, all worship the wall, 
The mighty wall. Yeah. The mighty yeah, wall. Yeah, you yeah. know, they climb yeah, the creaking yeah. stair mm -hmm. and, you know, say, sister, you are good. Right? right and all right. of that happens on that, in front of that mural. Absolutely. In the community. But see, you know, the, the, I, I think it's so wonderful that you bring up the wall because, you know, the Trayvon generation is itself, and that's why I wanted to, to kind of hold the book. It, it is its own you know it's a little monument, right? I okay. mean, you, I mean, I think it Run is. With it. <laughs> I mean, it, it really is. And I mean, the things that it commemorates and, and recalls and, and helps us to remember, you know, it, it, it's a really powerful archive. I mean, and, and so this is where we can, we can have some fun because it's an archive that, that includes Hurston and it include, includes Atelia Cromwell. If you don't know who she is, you know get the book, that kind yes. of thing. And it includes, um, of course, tra the Trayvon generation. But part of what it does is, is really powerfully kind of mash up this, um, this longer scene of, of, of references um, that, that produces and accrues to a type of, 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 of monument to black cultural thought and idea that is I love that. really, really, just it gave me chills that part Aww. of it so that's why I, that's why I describe it as multifaceted because it, it wasn't it, it, it this book has so many different surfaces and planes to 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 stand on well and if I could just because I, I I mean I so appreciate what you're saying and to talk about the scholarship and the archival work in it and wanting in a very small distilled book where I'm saying here's a work of art here's a poem now I'm going to talk for a little while right now I'm going to tell you about what happened when the great John Hope Franklin, and again, just thinking about, mm -hmm. you know, longtime professor at the, at the University of Chicago, uh, and wrote the, you know, great history of African American life from slavery to freedom, but uh, he was commissioned to write a, a history book on American history by the state of California in the mid 1960s. I tell this story in the mm -hmm. book, and uh, a whole full fledged uh, book banning campaign and uh, you know there were film strips that were made about him saying he was a communist and he had done mm -hmm. all these things because the book he said was fomenting black hatred that the book was anti-white that the book told the story of native people and black people alongside the stories of white people and that couldn't possibly be American history so mm -hmm. here one of our great American historians like you're fine if you stay over there and you talk about black people all by themselves and we don't have to think about black people at the center of US culture, mm -hmm. right? But the minute you do that, we're going to try to take you, we're not gonna let you do the work of telling the whole story. Right, right. So I think that's really important and really interesting. And as it turns out mm -hmm. with you know all that is happening now with the huge increasing in book banning and with all of the mania over faux critical race theory, mm -hmm. like how in the world did they take <laughs> critical race theory? How did they I take that? I didn't see that coming. I didn't see that coming either. <laughs> that you know? was pretty shocking. Yeah, I think that like, was still Was it someone I taught? <laughs> you know, I mean, you sort of think like this is like these are tools that yeah. we use. Yeah. Yes. You know? We thought 19. Yeah. We I don't studied know. that in the early 90s. But, you didn't but, think that you know, was going to happen. To understand, you know, that that that, you know, past is prologue mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. or to, to, you know, to look at in the letters, um, an amazing letter that the great Zora Neale Hurston you know, an incredible letter writer, in addition to the wonderful books like Their Eyes Were Watching God that we know her for, mm -hmm. wrote to W.E.B. B. Du Bois, uh, and she used the beautiful phrase. She said, I w I'm coming to you with an idea. What do you think about making what she called a cemetery, a cemetery. for the illustrious Negro okay. dead? You, so who's going to do that? <laughs> he said, well, I know, because if yeah. we don't tell our stories yeah. and memorialize ourselves properly, right. no. No one will. We will go, she said, in conspicuous forgetfulness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Hurston herself died uh, at that moment, alone and unremembered, buried in an unmarked think, grave in a weedy and field. And I think malnourished or something, if yes. I remember the story correctly. Yes. So, you know, again, I, I loved that because while Hurston feels like, uh, again, in the Trayvon generation, um, a household name and uh, well-known, um, I, I do remember the period when she was being excavated yes. actively yes. by, and so I, so I, so this, this is sort of what I was trying to say. I so appreciate this moment when the book itself 
quietly memorializes and brings to life and excavates uh, the, the, uh, some of these, these, these persons and reminds us that, that that's a hard move. It's a mm -hmm. hard move to historicize and platform mm -hmm. um, some of these minoritized histories. It seems really, really simple. Mm. But that was a hard move in whatever the 80s it wasn't oh, much before that to yeah, bring Hurston no, back into consciousness. Um, and, and so I appreciated that you did that in, in now, in 2022, just to help us recall the, the generational. I mean, the book is so much about um, uh, the Trayvon generation, but I have to say it made me think a lot um, about our generation and, mm -hmm. and generationality in general. Yeah, um, yeah. And you said something, you, you read from the, the passage where you, sp when you were at the podium, you spoke to the importance of generations speaking to each other. And there was another just powerful way that you would discuss something through your language. What is it? Um, oh my God, you talk about just, uh, you, can, you can remind me what the language is, but when you talk about being late, you know, for a generation, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, late for for the, the you know the tra Trayvon generation. Um, uh, oh goodness, I can't find my note there. Uh, but but my just own kind sense of, of being born you're too late. Being yeah. born too late to mm -hmm. to sort of fully comprehend how your sons and and his generation were are taking in knowledge and information, and there is something really tragic about that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and yet we have to think about ways to resolve that, that, that problem. Well, and I think to the, you know, to the born too late, um, I think that the kind of pass along from it is when I was younger, I thought, you know, and I looked at, um, at friends who were dear friends who were older than me, who mm -hmm. had done so, some of whom are here, who did so much, did all they could, put themselves all the way out there to try to better the society. Mm -hmm. And I would at first say, what would I have done if that was me? Right. You know, I don't know what I would have done. But then what I soon came to understand is, where do you stand now? Mm -hmm. What can you do where you are? What are the challenges of your generation? How do you meet, how do you push the limits as far as you can, not only with your generation, but also with the place where you stand. Are you someone right. who is going to try to evolve an institution? Mm -hmm. uh, apparently that seems to be what I'm supposed to do, right? You know, yeah, is, right. is, and I wouldn't have known that. I didn't make a plan to do that. Mm -hmm. But to, you know, my, to my, my beloved late father from whom I learned so very, very much and who is my fire and my impetus and the reason, mm -hmm. he said, you better get your work done fast, girl, because when they figure out what you're trying to do, they might ask for their keys back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's how he taught me about institutions, right? You know, work fast, work fast, work fast. Do right. as much as you right. can. Don't assume that things are going to be oh, yeah. the way they feel right now. Yeah. You're cute now. <laughs> Things will change, uh, yeah, and haven't yeah. we seen that yeah. in the last, you know, eight years in the country? Yeah, I know the passages about your father are quite powerful also. Um, there's another anecdote maybe in that same passage that stayed with me, and there'll be a question at the end of this, but, but the, the, the notion of, of, of having your dime, having, having enough yeah. money to break out and to break away, and that that's, um, you know, emblematic of a kind of power that you, you need to have vis-a-vis -vis institutions and other moments in life. And I guess the question, I, I really thought a lot about this, um, Elizabeth, it's another way that the, this book is much needed. I think every mm. week, lots of us need to, to, to know those, fa those secrets, mm. that whether they're family secrets or, or kind of racial ethnic secrets. I think like so many racial ethnic communities have these things that, that, that could propel us uh, in ways that we, that we need emotionally and, and professionally. But, but that notion of, his, of your having, having the money to break, break away if you need to, what what are what might be some? He of called the, it fu money. Yeah, we called okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, and the idea was that it wasn't even necessarily about literally how much money. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, some of us will remember, you know, a dime to make an emergency phone call. <laughs> um, but it was it was more an attitude that meant it, it wasn't always practical. Yeah, right. But you know that for your soul to be free, for you to be able to do your work, you always have to have a sense of self reliance so that you know you're not in a relationship you're not in a job you're mm -hmm. not in any place where you can't get out right right uh, and 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 so what that means also is that even as you learn the parameters and the paradigms mm -hmm. 
you also know that they weren't made for you. Mm -hmm. So thus creativity is born. Yeah, yeah. What are, what are some of those things, and I don't imagine we can sketch them right now, but you know, a li some of those things that we might impart to the Trayvon generation. So what are those, those, those like the anecdote with your father about the, the, the FU money? Um, what, what, other, what things do they need to, to know from us? Um, in order to, to, to kind of get to that, that freedom space that you write about? Well, I think that, um, and that's really, you know, how we raise young people and teach them, uh, you know, from when your children are little, how to be safe. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I remember my children walking to the corner to the mailbox or you know, the, the, the first things that they did alone without me, mm -hmm. I can feel how hard that was. And that was before because they were never out of sight. Right. We got to a stage where they were really on their own. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that as black parents, you know, we just all know about the conversations about, mm -hmm. you know, some people call it the talk. Right. Uh, if you're in car culture, mm -hmm. uh, somewhere where there's a car, you know, how do you... Uh, you know, be safe if you're thing. in a situation, yeah. you, you know. Uh, I tell the story of my father in Harlem in his childhood and his mother, uh, my amazing, ferocious grandmother, uh, who his first police encounter in his childhood, mm -hmm. he was eight years old. Right. And she said to him, you better be good at math. You better memorize that badge number. Oh, yeah, that was amazing. Get out of the situation right. politely and safely, but you better come home with that badge number, and then we will handle it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and just to think, like this black woman in Harlem in 1940-some is saying, and then we will handle it. And then we'll handle yeah. Right, but, you know, get my baby, mm -hmm. my baby back home. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that, that there is all of that, but I think then the other part is, you know, what do we want for our children? What do we want for all young people? Well, my goodness, like joy, oh my God, learning, yeah. Yeah, yeah. bodily freedom, <laughs> uh, exhilaration, um, you know, rigor. I mean, I do think that, that you, you know, that, that to, to study, to learn, to mm -hmm. know uh, mm -hmm. that where we stand at a moment in history, at a place in time, it is not just being hatched out of an egg, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to know that they don't have to worry alone, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To know that we love them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to know that we love them. Yeah. I mean, it's another um, to one. Know, of the, to, yeah. to hear them, to hear them. I think to welcome their friends. You know, I mean, I do think, you know, and we're here again in Chicago where Gwendolyn Brooks is everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that idea that there's no such thing as other people's children. Right. right. We can't live like that. Mm -hmm. We can't live like that. So I, I do think um, in my own experience, it's been important for my kids, you know, like bring your friends. You know, your friends are welcome here. There's always enough to eat. Again, something that I saw modeled by wise and beautiful parents who were my, my friends who did their child rearing a little bit ahead of me. Mm -hmm. So I think those are some of the things. No, that's exactly it. We can it. make a list together, right? Yeah, all no, of us. Absolutely, all of us. You know, then the book does transform, um, you know, it, it alters sort of what we should know. Um, so just as we should know these things about Hurston or know things about um, Atelia Cromwell or know things about, um, absolutely, as you say, there's a moment where you pull out the significance of, of dance, of, of, of movement and, and bodily joy and, and all of that. Um, dancing and crying are, are both um, you know, important mm -hmm. and their own forms of knowledge and you, you pull that out and I think a way that's, that's really beautiful. And if um, I could just say about crying, I mean there is a, a whole chapter that is called um, does the Negro shed tears? tears yeah. And again, you know, going back to, you know, I just find that everything I need to know uh, is in history. So it's called, I'm just gonna read a couple paragraphs, whether the Negro sheds tears. On April 3rd, a researcher named Alvin Bordquist of Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts, wrote to W.E.B. Du Bois, dear sir, we are pursuing an investigation here on the subject of crying as an expression of the emotions and should like very much to learn about its peculiarities among the colored people. 
we have been referred to you as a person competent to give us information upon the subject. We desire especially to know about the following salient aspects. One, whether the Negro sheds tears. And then it goes from there to, uh, uh, and you know, black, so I write, black people were to this researcher not understood to do something as fundamentally human as cry. And uh, then it goes to my watching the Derek Chauvin trial. And that, uh, that trial was many things, but also to me, it was uh, black man after black man after black man weeping. Weeping on the stand, re weeping talking about the trial, weeping watching it on television. Uh, and you know, the fundamental questions, are black people human? Do black people do what people do? Are black people people? If black people are not people and do not cry, then we do not experience pain or grief or trauma or shock or sorrow. If black people do not experience pain or grief or trauma or shock or sorrow, are we human? And if we are not human, can our continued violation be justified? Can black people be harmed if they cannot cry to say so? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, so I mean, yeah. I think that, you know, the history mm -hmm. take, you know, the, the, the archive takes us there. Yeah, and also just the, the, the absolutely, I'm so glad you read that, the, that passage because it's also the book fleshes out the, the license to, to move in our own direction strategically and tactically around some of these things, yep. like crying, like dancing. Of course, dancing has historically been the thing you're not supposed to do when you are organized and pulled together. <laughs> and so the, the license to, to kind of uh, dance or to cry or to, you know, I think there's so many other uh, 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 kernels in the book and, and of course others that we could sort of start to list and, and parse out. Um, there's another powerful uh, language idea that you, that you have here. Again, one that has utility. I think the ones I want to pull out are ones because I think they have so much utility for all of us around things that we need to, to think through differently. And the one that stood out is the triumphal end of racism. Mm. You, you sort of, you know, you know m m no, don't make a joke at all, but you say, why do we think there's going to be a triumphal end to this? It, there's not going to be. Mm. And um, I just think that's fascinating. And I, I wonder if, you know, rather than thinking of, of the, the, that, that racism is going to end at some point and living for that moment and hoping and praying for that moment, which I think we probably have done for centuries, mm -hmm. rather than that, what would it be to, to see this as a never ending problem and then to sort of, I think that's what the parents are saying, you know, keep, have your FU money. Mm -hmm. Just be ready because it's mm -hmm. probably not going to end. Mm -hmm. um, but, but how do we match that up with that reality? Um, with um, the, the freedom, the hope, the joy, with these other things that we want to impart to the Trayvon generation? You know, I think that um, where we are in history individually is so important to how we look yeah. at things. And so I think of myself as, as having grown up in a generation where it felt like we were moving forward. So, and yeah. even if it was two steps forward, one step back, it felt that, you know, sometimes, you know, by representation, you'd see people in places that you hadn't seen them before with increased responsibility or, mm -hmm. you know, certainly taught that you have to work. They didn't say twice as hard, twice as good in my house. They yeah. said, it's, yeah. like, it's like, you know. Harder? It, it, or, yes. it, it, many, 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 many times. Many times more. No, that's yeah. I know that one too. It, like, it worked it's much harder. Twice, yeah. I mean, much better. Um, but that that would mean something. You know, and it doesn't mean nothing. Mm -hmm. it, means, it means a lot. It's the, it's the only thing, I think, to prepare ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think, you know, this you ask, what are we saying to young people? Like, mm -hmm. prepare yourself right. for what you will face and how you will lead us. You know, be right. that smart. Right. You know, I mean, we're like, we're right there with you, but we need you to see it your different way. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but I do think that um, a lot of the things that we now see are being undone. You know, certainly the, the, the way that we're now thinking about and seeing and understanding the fragility of democracy mm -hmm. uh, was not the way that I saw yeah. black people ac across the spectrum exactly. uh, of, of politics. You know, yes, we knew we were the upholders of, 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 of democracy, but 
I don't think we thought it was this fragile. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it, it is it is a particular a particular time. Yeah, the the undone that um, that Elizabeth kind of parses out in this book also is a, is a key idea. Uh, word language idea, I think, as well. The, un the undone. You talk oh, about the I undone. Say? You that? say the undoing or the undoing of pro the undone or the undoing of progress. Um, um, it's somewhere. I could well, yeah. I mean, and, and you know, with the with the book opening as it does, you know, there's that allusion to Du Bois, who, you know, in the Souls of Black Folk, he writes in 1903, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, and so when I say the problem of the 21st century remains the color line. Mm -hmm. um, I do think, and this is back to something that you said, um, until we are all able to understand racism as constitutive mm -hmm. of the country's, uh, how the country was built. Right. If we still keep acting like it's a problem over here to be solved, so that to the right. quote about the triumphal, the triumphal um, then it. we will never uh, 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 you know, understand I mean, if you think about even something as simple as how is it, if you look at stereotype, how is it that the stereotype that black people are lazy, we know this is not mm -hmm. true, mm -hmm. but wow, who authored that idea that the people whose hands and backs built this goddamn nation are the ones who don't work? It's interesting spin, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> profound, it's profound. So yeah. to me, it's more than just, you know, I feel like in our generation, you come along where like, you mm -hmm. prove yourself not lazy, you prove mm -hmm. yourself not totally, lazy, totally. right? Um, yeah. But, you know, I feel like now, what, you know, we're talking about and understanding with our young people is like, who made that up? Where'd that come from? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, like, how, how, how did we inherit that? Mm -hmm. And so then I think, you know, again, the question, together, it's, it is, it, the book is a call for right. together. Right. Uh, we, we, we keep it moving forward. And also it's a call to, as you're saying, just, uh, you know, original thinking, uh, free thinking around some of these problems. Like you're yes. saying, that's not really true. So you want, you know. It's not true. Every time we can say that's a fallacy, that's false, then you can start with a fresh thought around right, the given exactly. problem. And so the book really does, again, platform some of that. You know, the other thing it does, which is, you know, sort of right there in, in, in the title and in the thesis and the idea of the Trayvon generation. And I thought, I've never thought about this before uh, as, as, as actively or dynamically is that you affirm black boys and men in a way that you affirm in a way that maybe think differently about kind of you know logics of affirmative action or something I was like well hmm. you know that matters but also there's this other affirmation that we can do all of us that that want to think about um, affirming black boys and men you know and so there, that's another sort of powerful aspect of this, which is that we can do that in kind of quieter ways than just those that are, you know, legal and Well, because societal. we certainly, it seems, are going to have to figure We're out what to, to do, do without that. affirmative <laughs> action. You know, so, yeah. I mean, I say that not in a doomsday fashion, yeah. though, you know, it seems likely, but more importantly, again, what do we, what is within our power? Exactly. What can we do? Right. Uh, and how do we vision, you know, right. something right. different? And I wanted just because I also know we're we're, we're getting to yeah, questions, but I wanted to just and here I'm glad we're on this picture right oh, yeah. now, which the photographer Deborah Luster took in mm -hmm. Angola prison. Oh, thank you for bringing that back. Um, <laughs> and there's another uh, picture uh, in there uh, by Chandra McCormick of uh, Daddio uh, is his name, the oldest living inmate at yeah. Angola prison. Mm -hmm. And so, um, y you know, a, a very important part of the book is the chapter that bears witness to a visit to Angola, Angola prison, oh, yeah. which uh, as you know, many of you perhaps know, but it ha houses the largest population of lifers on this planet. It 90% of the people who are incarcerated there will die there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you go to see it, it used to be a plantation. And when you go today, it is as big as the island of Manhattan. There is a golf course on Angola prison where you can sit in a cafe if you are free and entertain yourself after your game of golf by looking at Camp J, which is the cell block where people are held in solitary. That's what you see as you sip and nibble after you've played your golf. And what you see when you go into Angola is you see black and brown men literally picking okra and picking cotton and white men on horses who are mm. 
guarding them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just bearing witness to that and talking about the ways that some artists, as it happened, I talk about two, one black woman, two white women artists, Deborah Luster, who, who took pictures of people who were incarcerated there and gave them to their families and gave them to them mm -hmm. and asked people to, you know, dress in a way, you know, to use props to do, to, to say something and to write a text about themselves on the pictures. Yeah, right. And the artist Jackie Samel, uh, who uh, had a very, very long uh, friendship and correspondence with Herman Wallace, mm -hmm. who was one of uh, the people held in Angola who's hel held in solitary for 40, 41 years. Oh, yeah, that was now. Yeah. Okay. And she corresponded with him around the question, how would you dream, what would you picture if you pictured your home? Your home, yeah. And then she made the home. She drew the home. She made a maquette of the home. She constructed the home. He was shown to have been uh, uh, wrongly convicted. He was released. He met her, he spent time with his family, and he died three days later. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I just feel, you know, I'm a poet. Yeah. I tell stories, I bear witness, and I just think that's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so I just wanted to talk about that. I mean, it's, it's incredibly, you know, one of the questions I did have is really about the, the way the book absorbs art and visual art and why I think you, you address that, that beautifully. Um, and, and, you know, that is another one of the, the facets of it. It, it. You know, if you drill down on another one of its surface, there is a, a really interesting conversation about um, contemporary art and, and its uh, potential and its ability to, to, again, sort of create some of the aspiration that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, again, just another piece of this, of this incredibly rich, rich project. Well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank oh you. Um, I think there's I think some, have yeah, I think questions. Have some questions yeah. from the audience. It looks like there's a roving mic. Hello. Hi. Uh, I'm going to make a comment, and then my daughter wants to ask a question. Ooh. Okay. Right. I am the niece of Jeff Donaldson. Oh, my goodness. One of the Artists of the Wall of Respect, I yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. For the first um, artist exchange between the United States and uh, Africa back in 1977. Uh, for my extended family, I want to say thank you <laughs> so much uh, that you are preserving that legacy, part of my uncle, but also of Afro-Cobra and part of the South Side of Chicago and that bounteous revolution, artistic revolution that they gave to not only America, but to the world. Uh, this is to me also from my extended family as well. I didn't know this until you, till it came up uh, that you are one of the preservers of that, but thank you, thank well, you. Well, this one right thank here, you. yes, yes, God yes. Bless, God bless both of All you. Of <laughs> we greatly appreciate what you've done, and now I'm gonna let my daughter on generation. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, hi, Miss Alexander. Hello, um, could, what's so your name and could you stand my, up? Yes, uh, my Thank name you. is Marissa. And um, my question, I was sitting with this question probably for the last 20 or so minutes. Um, so in regards to the Trayvon generation, um, so I was thinking about how I'd word this directly just because the idea isn't to offend anybody, but it's probably gonna be a little bit controversial, my question. In your opinion, what's a way that um, is a non-performative way for non-black people to teach their kids about the Trayvon era? Because um, in retrospect, if you think about who is responsible for the Trayvon era yep. and making black traumatized people that have access to social media to see black and brown bodies die, on a regular basis, it is white and non-black people. Yep. And I think so many people from, in quote, the Trayvon era are sick and tired of teaching people that have had hundreds of years of being able to have access to this information, um, especially because we're, we shouldn't be responsible for having to teach white people who have the access and the money and the knowledge 
um, as opposed to having to constantly be re-traumatized when there's more people that die on a regular basis, on a daily basis. So what are ways, as opposed to, and this doesn't deserve a, necessarily a, a clap, a snap, what are ways for non-black people to actually teach their children not to be a part of the opposing side of the Trayvon movement? Because when we're thinking about the Trayvon movement, we are also raising a generation or, you know, allowing a generation of enabled people that still have you know, their, their same white lineage as far as being slave owners and holding black people captive and not allowing black people to have access to education, to healthcare, to food insecurity, to environmental racism. There's all these other factors that play into why the Trayvon era is what it is or the Trayvon generation is what it is. So in your opinion, what are some ways that non-black people can make other people, um, I guess, have access or I guess teach other black people because, you know, outside of just having things like this, it's like people go home to their white homes, their white cracker, you know, cracker cut homes with, you know, a white picket fence and they have this conversation amongst their friends and it ceases after this. So outside of a conversation like this, what are things that people can actually do? like whether it be opening you. their checkbooks, funding black arts, et cetera, et cetera, so that the Trayvon generation doesn't continue because the Trayvon generation isn't just 25 years old. I think it's probably 85 years old. The difference is we just now have access with social media and being able to have phones and like you said, having your kids be able to look at people being murdered under the covers before they go to their third grade class. So how do we also teach white children not to be enablers and also play into that rhetoric that their parents' generations basically put us in. Yeah, thank mm. you. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, I think, you know, there's uh, <coughs> one single sentence early on in the book, first page of the book, which I want people to carry through the book, which is, I can't solve white supremacy because I didn't create white supremacy. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't say it in a kind of a, you know, so in a dismissive way. I say it in a think about that for a minute way, which addresses the very point that you're bringing up about the disproportionate responsibility that you know we that has been put upon us to be the teachers, uh, to you know, and, and that that unto itself can be exhausting, uh, can be demoralizing, can be enraging, uh, to continually uh, have that as a responsibility, you know. My, my answer to most things is black studies. <laughs> uh, and I'm serious, actually. Um, because when I think about my own decades of teaching black studies, uh, that in those classes, every classroom I ever taught in was a mixed classroom. You know, so I think that somehow people think that if you teach black studies that you're, you know, indoctrinating, you know, a, a little army of black people who are gonna go out and, you know. No, actually, like, black studies at most universities is telling everybody at the same time to work through and learn together about the true history of our country and the power of its culture. So, I mean, I think expanding and not just, you know, black studies is a proxy for all the studies, right? You know, what would it mean? And, and look why, why it's getting banned right now. Mm -hmm. Look at all the learning and knowledge that's getting banned right now. Look at the way that you can't teach history to kids in the state of Florida and so many other places. That's because there is real power there. Let's forget us for a minute. For the white people who I have taught over so many years who have been turned out by what was kept from them, and many of whom have taken it into their lives and their communities and their families mm -hmm. uh, in very, very powerful ways of, of what it means to take responsibility, you know, what it means to see with different eyes. So the answer, the one answer I have is to think about from many angles, what would it mean if right from the beginning, everybody had to have a different kind of education that really let them learn on their own and even let them learn when they're getting contradictory messages, even in the classroom, even at home, to use their own critical thinking, to continually ask the questions that, you know, when people look at the truth and ask the questions why, 
I think can help some of them to, to do differently and to do better. That's what I got. That's great. Yeah. Did you want to yeah. add to that? Well, you know, I, I think it's exactly that. I would say another thing I'm, I've been shocked by that there's never been a, a kind of disciplinary space or, or ground for comparative racial ethnic studies. Mm -hmm. Just never any space for that. And mm -hmm. I think there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, because yeah, I, yeah. Think, um, I think that, that if there was a way to understand sort of points of commonality, some of this would be reduced to some extent. There's, there's no room for that. And you know, we, we're talking about John Hope Franklin, but in From Slavery to Freedom, he asked an absolutely profound question that mm -hmm. is relevant today. He said, why is it that at the end of, of the Civil War, that white people, most of whom were peasants, if you will, that's the language he uses, right? Most of whom were poor agricultural workers, white people in this country, why did they identify with whiteness mm -hmm. as opposed to with the planter class, right. right? As opposed to why did the ideology of whiteness call them further into something that actually was not theirs, although it did come to be theirs, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, Some yeah, of them, yeah. as opposed to the people who were actually, uh, you know, in the same kinds of, of yeah. struggles that, that they were. So I, this, this is just the way I know to do it. Yeah, I agree. Oh, hey, hey, can we get this hot? Oh, hey, hey, Elizabeth, hey, Romy, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, one thing that you said that uh, resonated with me pretty, pretty hard was the talk. And I know a lot of people in the audience probably hear that and don't fully understand what that means, especially me being a, a black man of darker skin. That talk has been happened to me way too many times to count. So I think I would just like for, um, if you can give like a brief description of what that means. Well, you know, I'm gonna ask you to tell <laughs> about the talk. Yeah, you know, let's make it a conversation. Can, exactly. I can give it, but you know. Tell what the is, talk is, tell what the talk is. So for those who don't know, you know for my non-black um, and brown folks in this room, the talk is the talk you have, and particularly came from my father. My father is about six, eight, 400 mm. pounds, darker than me. So that talk for me looked like, you know, son, you have to work twice as hard than your white counterpart. You have to be twice as perfect in your speech, uh, in your stance, uh, in your verbiage, in your vocabulary. I'm kind of getting a little shaken up to talk about it because mm. it really is that, it is that much of a, of a trigger of trauma yeah. that you instill into your kid. I'm about five years old, but I'm bigger than all the kids in the class. You know, I'm 10 years old, I'm five, eight, <laughs> you know. So now I'm getting misidentified uh, for a teenager that somebody's looking for, and I'm a child. Uh, so if you don't know what the talk is, if you haven't had that talk with your child, uh, even if you're not black, I would suggest that you still educate yourself on what that talk looks like. Uh, because even though if it doesn't happen to your child who's not black, it can happen to a friend of theirs or a friend of theirs or a friend of theirs. So it's important to your point, what you said just a minute ago. <clears throat> and I'm going to relax when I say Aww. this, sorry. Uh, it's important to know that we're all resources in this room and mm. we should not try to stray away from sharing that information with each other yeah even if it hurts even if it's un uncomfortable the un the uncomfortable conversations are the best ones to have yeah because they release something off of you yes and you gain mm -hmm. something back from that it's liberating to say hey this shit happens to me yeah and i don't want it to happen to you yep. i don't want to happen to anybody who you love so to go back to you, Elizabeth. That was my question, <laughs> just to be like, hey, you know, could you explain that importance to you, what that talk means? And uh, yeah, I'm gonna go sit down. So yeah, that was my question. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much, yeah. thank you. Um, you know, it's different, uh, it, it's, it's different words uh, and, and variations, but I mean, that's basically what it is. You know, there's some, um, and you know, it's, and it's not just, it's boys and girls, girls yeah. right? I mean, so there, you know, there are versions of how we say 
this could happen to you. This is how they look at you. This is how you keep yourself safe. This is how you, you know, this is how you, to, 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 to my grandmother, to my father, get, get yourself home safe. <laughs> Polite your way out of it, <laughs> even if that's not what you feel. And I think that, that also how to make space for the appropriate feelings, which include, are, are, are not about politeness. They're about fear. They're maybe about, about anger. You know, where is the place where you can have those feelings where it doesn't endanger you? There's some um, very, very, very sobering uh, research by uh, a Professor Philip Atiba Goff, mm. where uh, he uh, looks at the ways, and he's working with police departments, and he is asking people, he's showing them pictures of, you know, black boy, white boy, black girl, white girl, how old are they? And this is condensing huge, huge research, but the gist is that black children were aged by four years. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, my baby was 12 when they told me, I said, wait a minute, my, ch my, my baby is 18? In there, yeah. You know? And uh, so, you know, I mean, Gwendolyn Brooks, what do I tell my children who are black, who are adjudged the least wise of the land? Mm -hmm. What do I tell my children, right? And I think that, that what you say that is just so important uh, about uh, not carrying that woe along, alone because we carry it, because it lives inside of us, because it makes us sick, because it dies us young. So, you know, what does it mean to, to talk to each other? And again, once again, you know, to, to, to love as many children as you can, you know? Mm -hmm. Like for everybody in here to commit themselves, what does it mean to love black and brown children? Mm -hmm. And I think to, I mean, absolutely, and I think to, to map out again what the, the book, you know, uh, platforms is just ways for us to map out and sketch some of these methods. So it's really true. There's variability in the talk. So what would it be like to pull together so many versions of the talk um, so that we could, you know, expose, mm -hmm. again, knowledge that we have been you know, kind of imparting and, and sharing, and it doesn't maybe look like the, the knowledge that's showing up in some other space. Yeah, that's But it's right. incredibly important and often has success where your father got you through into something. So, yeah, I think that's what we And also, you know, and back to, to, to your wonderful, you know, um, your comments and your question, uh, 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 the young person back here, um, I think that I lost my train of thought. It was about the talk. It was about the things we share. It was about not worrying alone. Oh, um, about um, having some hope for um, what can really happen in the space of honest friendship. Mm -hmm. You know, what can really happen with uh, white parents and parents of color whose children are you know, going to school together or playing at the playground or, you know, coming over to each other's homes. Uh, and, 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 you know, what does it mean for uh, a white kid to have an understanding of what his or her black friend is living with mm -hmm. in a way that's not condescending, that doesn't make the black people work, <laughs> um, but that says we are human beings learning from each other. You know, we are empaths. What do I now do with that? You know, I, I will always hold on to, to that hope. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hello, Elizabeth. My name is Blake Anthony Johnson. So I have a few roles here, but my main role is uh, CEO of Chicago Symphonietta Orchestra. And oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so I have a comment and a question, really, because when you mentioned the talk, it hit me very hard. So mm -hmm. a lot of people see me with my two, my teenage nephews, um, many one, many two, uh, if you will. And for me, because uh, a lot of people still, I don't think will understand the talk. So I just want to comment a little bit on this. It was a huge debate in my family when to give them the talk. Mm. Because for me, it was how long do we preserve their innocence versus yes. their safety? 
And so for me, when I think of the talk, I think of Brian Nicholson. So Stone Mountain is actually my hometown. Ah. Um, so when Brian Nicholas had this trial, so if you don't live in Georgia, essentially it was a man who escaped a, a trial and I think uh, injured someone or he may have actually killed someone in the actual courthouse. I couldn't leave the house. <laughs> I yeah. couldn't go to school. I mean, it was a very traumatic thing. People were literally being ripped out of their cars. Um, anyone between 14 and 18. Um, so I, I just think when people hear the talk, um, me explaining this actually to my counterparts of like, why are you so kind of in turmoil? And like, do you protect their innocence or their safety? Because at some mm. point you have to decide. And I don't know any other demographic that has to make that choice. So that's kind of the essence of the talk. So that's my comment. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, you have done amazing work with the, the monuments. And as you probably know, the city of Chicago itself is doing a huge kind of uh, calibration in terms of what it means to have mon monuments in the city. So I'm really curious kind of what's making its way back to you since you've really kind of tripled down in the space um, and any kind of uh, insight. I'd be really curious just to know kind of what you've seen since you've really doubled down on the work. On the, you mean in particularly in Chicago or throughout just the country? Throughout. You've been busy, so throughout. <laughs> yeah, well, um, so first of all, just do we protect their innocence or their safety? Mm -hmm. Okay, I just want to say that again. Uh, and I think that um, that's why I really hope that this book is a conversation because I feel like the part I can default to, you know, like I'm going to tell you about being mommy. I'm going to tell you about our block watch in New Haven, Connecticut, when my kids were 11 and 12, that said, black boys seen on bicycles, beware. Or someone who said on the block watch, you know, uh, 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 you know a, a black man knocked us. So now, you know, Philip Atiba Goff, right? So a black man is a 12 year old, right? You know, so a black man, you know, was seen on my porch and I told him to get, you know, and that that was at the same time that in an effort to show them, give them their first civic experience, I had let my kids go. A friend of ours was running for mayor and I let them, I said, you know, yes, you know, you go door to door, you have your Hammer Fernandez literature, like, you know, you're gonna go and do that. And that's what happened in the midst of the civics lesson. Mm -hmm. There was another lesson. So, I mean, I think that in assessing, you, you know, innocence or safety, I think for black parents to be talking to each other, because we can't process this with our poor kids, <laughs> you know, right? Um, and it is, a, it, 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 there's an infinity to talk about with this and to figure out how we calibrate this. And, and I think that the antidote, by the way, is something we do. It's safe spaces, it's community, it's family, it's dancing, it's food, it's our culture. It's all the ways that we make beautiful, safe black space. We do that ourselves. That's something we've done forever. We did it on the plantation as best we could, right? I mean, you know, there are so many ways that we uh, make that for our kids and fill them up, fill them up, fill them up. You know, sometimes it takes the form of food, you know, <laughs> for me, it does like eat, you have to be strong. <laughs> but what you're gonna eat, you know, you're gonna eat a lot of different things, but you're also going to eat the food that came through your family, that kept us strong all that time. You're gonna eat that too. You're gonna to know why you eat it. You're gonna eat your luck. You're gonna eat your luck on New Year's Day so that the rest of the year goes well. All of that we give them because it was given to us. Uh, and I think it's powerful and I think it's real. Monuments, it's amazing work. So this is the biggest commitment that the Mellon Foundation has ever made. And where we started, you know, we, we do it in, in sort of four different categories. And the first one we started with was research. There was no, you couldn't find out, uh, you know, well, how many monuments to this one and that one are there? What's actually out there? So uh, we work with a great group, uh, uh, Scheherazade, wherever you are, you know Paul Farber. <laughs> you know your sister's wonderful friend, Paul Farber, who runs Monuments Lab, an amazing, amazing person who's done, you know, nationwide work to start to do the math. So for example, 
everything you thought was bad was worse. <laughs> um, if you thought that there were very few representations of women in public spaces, parks, things named for women, not only were you correct, but perhaps what you didn't know is that women are more often, it's not funny, represented as mermaids, as Alice in Wonderland, <laughs> as magic fairies, you know, as inventions instead of women who actually lived and did things in this world. Uh, you know, that all of the numbers uh, of, uh, that are, again, worse than you would have imagined. Black people, Latinx people, Native people, Asian American people. It gets to the, you, you know, what they call it, um, insignificance data, that, that mm -hmm. phrase where the percentage point is so small that it's not measurable. Um, so, you know, it, it, that just gives us a sense of, of how much work there is to be done. And that, you know, seeing the ways, so one story I really love to tell and about why I love the work that I do is that, you know, in, in Kansas, there are um, the native people there, one of the native people are called the Cause, K-A-W-S people. And they, in their community, had a sacred mount, a uh, 25 ton, a mountain coming out of the ground, a mount. And 75 years ago, the white people who were establishing Lawrence, Kansas, they took it. They took it out the ground. They took a 25 ton mount. They moved it to Lawrence, Kansas. They posed in front of it, and they titled it Our Settler heritage. Oh my God. But karma's a bitch, isn't it? <laughs> and more than that, what I think is, you know, you think about that beautiful phrase, the arc of, 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 of the, the arc of the universe bends towards justice. Mm -hmm. So 75 years later, because we're not, it's not appropriate for us as a foundation to go and stir things up in different places, because that doesn't work. You know, people have to be doing the work that they're doing, and then they say, okay, you know, we've done this work, we want to do a thing, and we could use the, some resources. So they've done powerful reconciliation work in Lawrence, Kansas, and with the Native people, and they said, we want to give it back, but it costs $5 million to move it back. <laughs> so that's what my job is. <laughs> move that mother back. Get right? it back there. And I think that what is really just uh, amazing about that story and why I really love to tell it is that, you know, we don't always even imagine that the earth itself doesn't tell the truth. That the very earth can be disrespected and manipulated. Not only the people who live in it and have lived in it forever and ever, and so that it tells a different story but that there are some ways that you can begin to write it. But even more importantly, the, 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 the power of the story is that, and this is, it takes us back to the book, people hold their history. People hold their stories. People themselves don't forget. So I think that part of what we're just seeing in so many places is the ways that people have not forgotten and that it's just amazing to be able to be helpful when, uh, when, when, when people are ready to make those changes. Yeah. Oh. Hello. Oh. Hi. Hi. Um, <clears throat> my name is Kate. I am a part of the Trayvon generation. Um, I go to school on the south side of Chicago. And I'm actually a community organizer here in Chicago. Uh, back in January, I organized the largest student walkout in Chicago since 1963. Wow, 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 wow. Yeah. Um, actually, every single time that you use the term uh, the Trayvon generation, I thought of like every single Chicago kid that I know just standing on the stage having a light shined on us. Yeah. Um, not in a good connotation, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let me hear. Oh, um, and I think that that term, or not necessarily that term, but I think that when we talk about young people um, in more of a way that we're putting, in a, putting us on a pedestal and telling the stories of young people, um, I think that older people tend to take a, up a lot of space in the conversation about young people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, no, seriously. And mm -hmm. I th think that my question is, is that is it as important 
to, because I, I, we were just talking about the talk, and so I think a lot of times old people have, yeah, old have. I, I can't, I can't, I'm not old. <laughs> <laughs> but I have lived some years. <laughs> Older people um, have this, have a higher sense of conformity of how the world works, and so is it fair to have these conversations with younger generations and say, this is how the world works, or is it, that we sit down and allow young people to illustrate what the world looks like to us and what we would like to do with that world that is in mm -hmm. our hands. Um, mm -hmm. Allowing us to be illustrators and writers and leaders. I think a lot of the young people that I know in the Trayvon generation don't know that we're in the Trayvon generation mm -hmm. um, because we aren't given the tools and the resources and, and the love and the courage to push and, and, and understand and comprehend and acknowledge the world that's around us, but also who has shaped that world. Um, so yes, to go back to my question, is it as important to write these ideologies? Um, A little louder, because the yeah. mic to, is. To write these ideologies out for us, um, or to allow us the space and the resources and the tools to write it and tell it ourselves? Well, I think that you, you're, these are not mutually exclusive things. Yeah. So I wrote the book I wrote. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that in a, I'm saying I wrote the book I wrote. You know, I uh, wrote the book to be a conversation. Um, I wrote the book with what, and I know you're not talking about me writing the book per se. I know you're talking about something that's larger. Um, but I do think that, that, those two, that, that those are not mutually exclusive. So, you know, what can we do but share with each other is what I think. What can we do but share with each other? Um, because we belong to each other. And I, I think that, that, that making an offering from where you stand is an invitation to say, what's the offering from where you stand? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it really is an invitation and, and, and an exchange. You want to say some more? That. Um, I don't. I. I. <laughs> um, I. I just think that a lot of times when we have this generational conversation, there's a huge divide. Um, or at least from when I usually have this conversation, because how I see it is is that I have to live in this world that is just there for me. And I think especially right now, being in high school, and not only that, but being a kid in Chicago public schools, being a Chicago kid on the south side of Chicago, um, is I'm left to conform. Um, and, and that's really all that it is. Like, I feel like that's how the world looks, looks for me to do, to mm -hmm. conform or to fall at the feet of what is looked otherwise of me. And having to conform is something that I don't want to do. And I think that conformity looks like me going on, graduating from school, going to college, um, having a job, but I want to do much more than that, and I want to mm -hmm. be much more than that. And so how do we build uh, the communities? How do we build the space? And how do we build the imagination, um, not just for me, not just for you, but everyone? How do mm -hmm. we build that, and how do we uh, create a sense of nonconformity and, and kind of stopping that building of, of, of pushing people to conform mm -hmm. in this society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I understand that as a separate thing and really actually quite separate from what I'm talking about in the book. So if you heard anything about conformity, mm -hmm. it ain't there. Mm -hmm. It ain't there. What I'm saying is artists and writers who are the quintessential nonconformists because the job is, again, to see around the corner, to imagine what's not there, to, 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 to dream something and, and give form to something so that other people can, again, feel, but feel and respond mm -hmm. and be in a conversation. So, you know, the, the, the offering and the listening. Uh, so in the book, it's, it, it's offering, we've talked about Gwendolyn Brooks, we've talked about some of the artists, you know, who, for example, we were just looking at um, Jennifer Packer, some magic person up there was moving to the, the, the pictures. Uh, but at any rate, you know, many of, of the visual artists are, are younger, not, not kids, but, but younger artists who've had some time to practice their craft because that's also 
part of what me as a, a as a poet has said that like it's practiced and that's how I have hopefully been able to offer something that has a you know a, a clarity to it mm -hmm. which is what I want it to do so I think that that it, it the, the book is not about conforming the book is about imagining uh, and the book is about thank you that's uh, her her work, uh, Blessed Are Those Who Mourn, Brianna, Brianna. Mm -hmm. Really, really amazing uh, painting by Jennifer Packer. Um, so that's what I'm saying, is that is that where the book is coming from and where I'm coming from is not to conformity, but rather to mutuality and also the invitation to learn from each other. And, and I know we're out of time, so we're, we're basically wrapping up, but I, you know, I, I would just say that um, you know, ironically, I've, I've been working with a lot of, of people older than us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and so you don't want to necessarily assume that, that because one is generationally um, an elder to you that they are conformists. I've, I've found that some of the um, elders that I've been working on projects with are, are, are some of the most nonconformist human beings that I've ever met or encountered. So it's just a kind of way to be open-minded about um, about that. And which so. is to say also uh, that, that what you have done leading a, a, a walkout, what That's were the issues that you were organizing around? Uh, a school community like COVID safety and the conditions of students and teachers at the time, our teachers union also was on a labor stoppage. Mm -hmm. So I took it upon myself to organize a a, a walkout or a stoppage of labor among students as well. Mm -hmm. Well, that's amazing. Incredible. And I guess to, to me, what I always think is the question of how do we inhabit our generation? You know, how do we inhabit our generation? How do we meet the moment uh, is, is really, really uh, the powerful one. Mm -hmm. So I think Thank we're you. done for we're, the evening. Yes. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you.